From Sarasota Memorial and the Deb Kavanaugh Multimedia Studio, this is HealthCast, a healthy dose of information from experts you can trust. Hi, everybody. Welcome to HealthCast. I'm Allison Gottermeyer. Thank you so much for joining us today as we talk about a cancer treatment newly available at the Brian D. Jellison Cancer Institute at Sarasota Memorial called High Dose Rate Brachytherapy. Our guest today is Dr. Matthew Biagioli, a radiation oncologist here in Sarasota, fellowship trained in brachytherapy. Dr. Biagioli, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Let's start from the beginning here. Yeah. What exactly is brachytherapy and how does it differ from external radiation? Yeah, I mean, I think when you think about radiation treatments, specifically for cancer, there's kind of like three main modalities. So you've got external radiation therapy, which is what most people are familiar with, where you have kind of these high energy beams coming from a big machine that are kind of going through tissue to get to where the cancer is. And then you've got some radioactive isotopes that are occasionally labeled to say like an antibody or something like that. They're given they're very specific treatments that are given intravenously. And then you've got brachytherapy, which is really basically internal radiation. So I think the way that I would think of it, where you're basically introducing kind of a radioactive element inside the tumor and you're radiating from the inside out, you know, and in the, the best scenario, you're given a really high dose of radiation to the cancer without really giving any radiation to the surrounding tissues. So how does high dose rate differ from previous brachytherapy techniques used? Yeah, so the original form of brachytherapy was something called low dose rate. And, and what they're talking about is it's still a radioactive element that's delivering that radiation dose. With low dose rate, the radiation is given over the course of usually days to months. And so like a classic example of that would be, you know, prostate seed implant where they place these radioactive pellets into the prostate and then the radiation might be delivered over the course of really, you know, depending on the isotope up to nine months, you know, with high dose rate, you're usually introducing a catheter or you think of it almost like a needle that's being inserted into the tumor. And then the radioactive source goes inside the catheter. It delivers a high dose of radiation, usually over the course of a few minutes. And then it comes out, you take the catheter out, and nothing's actually permanently left inside of the, the, the person or the, the cancer itself. So you mentioned prostate cancer there, but what types of cancer um, patients are candidates for yeah, no, that, therapy? That's an excellent question. So primary, like the, the majority of patients treated with, with brachytherapy are typically prostate cancer, GYN cancers, both cervical and endometrial cancer, breast cancer and skin cancers. And then there's some um, not there's some more specific treatments that are not that are not done as commonly, which include, you know, for certain brain cancers, for uh, liver cancer, for in Europe, they do it for in, in some places, they do it for bladder cancer. Um, but it can be used just about anywhere. But primarily, at least in the US, it's the focus has been on prostate, GYN cancer, skin, and breast. And are there different criteria used for this high dose rate brachytherapy? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really not so much like patient characteristics that would determine someone that would get low dose rate versus high dose rate, but think of it more of like an evolution of the technology where, you know, low dose rate was kind of the original form of brachytherapy that was introduced. And it still has a role to play in today's um, healthcare market, albeit smaller, high dose rate is kind of like generation two of brachytherapy, um, where it, it allows for some much more sophisticated imaging that allows us to kind of cater those treatments more specifically to those patients. So you mentioned that it's most commonly used with prostate cancer and those GYN cancers. Let's start with prostate brachytherapy first. Why might this be a preferred treatment for a patient with prostate cancer? So there's really kind of two different patient populations that might benefit from brachytherapy um, in terms of prostate cancer patients. So the first are those patients that might have, um, you know, a less aggressive type of cancer um, where you're looking at really primarily like a more localized treatment. Um, and so those patients might be a good candidate for either external radiation, 
brachytherapy or surgery. Um, and it's really more of a function of, you know, what are the side effect profiles um, that, you know, a, that, that, would, that a patient might feel comfortable with. Because, you know, the side effects and possible complications with surgery are very different than what they would be for brachytherapy and, and what they would be for external radiation. Um, but the outcomes are all the same. So you could undergo a major surgery versus, you know, go through what might be 28 to 40 external radiation treatments versus go through one or two internal radiation treatments. Um, the other patient population that, that we know benefits from it are those patients that have more aggressive tumors, whether typically classified as high-risk cancer patients. And so in those patients, there was a landmark trial that came out of British Columbia called the Ascent RT trial, that wherein they kind of randomized patients with high-risk prostate cancer to those getting hormone therapy with external radiation therapy over the course of eight weeks versus those that got hormone therapy with external radiation just for five weeks, followed by an uh, one single internal HD or, or, or brachytherapy treatment. And what they found is that those patients that got the combination of external and internal, it reduced their likelihood of, of a recurrence by 50%. So you mentioned there are different side effects to brachytherapy or, or, or different things that someone might take into account if they're going to choose brachytherapy over surgery or another treatment option. Um, what are those? What, what are there additional side effects or what are the side effects you discuss with patients? Yeah, so for patients that are looking at just getting HDR brachytherapy alone for their prostate cancer, um, the way that that procedure is done is basically, you know, we put the patients to sleep, we, you know, we through the skin introduce these catheters into the prostate, usually under ultrasound guidance, although it can be done under CT guidance as well. Um, and then they use some fancy software that essentially j figures out where the radiation needs to go inside each one of those catheters to treat the cancer and avoid giving radiation treatment to you know the, the organs that might be in close proximity in this case it's the bladder and the rectum um, and then that treatment is delivered usually over the course of about five minutes those catheters are removed you know the patient the patient's woken up we make sure they're urinating okay and they go home because of the trauma introduced from the placement of the catheters, as well as because some inflammation that's created by the radiation, the most common side effect we see are lower urinary tract symptoms. And so what I mean by that are patients will typically have some increase in frequency of urination, maybe some urgency, maybe getting up in the middle of the night to urinate, most of which will resolve over the course of about a week or two. How long will someone with prostate cancer undergo this brachytherapy treatment. Yeah, so it really kind of is determined based on how it's being used. So for patients that might have an early stage cancer where we're just doing brachytherapy alone, our typical regimen would be it's two treatments separated by three weeks apart. So we do the procedure, which usually consists of an outpatient procedure that might take a morning. We do the deliver that treatment. That patient goes home, we have them come back three weeks later, we do a second treatment, and that's actually their entire treatment. And you kind of mentioned this before, but this is a, a benefit of brachytherapy over external radiation. It's less treatments. So for someone who might have a challenging schedule, especially, that's an added bonus. Yeah, and so when we guide patients in helping them to make a determination of what treatment option might be best for them, you know, a lot of it that we take into account is obviously, you know, the type of cancer that they have what stages are cancer, but the other things, the other X factors, you know, that affect every individual that they're kind of bringing to the table in terms of, you know, what their situation is and, you know, what their job situation might be, what their home situation might be so that we can try and best find the right treatment that not only is going to give them an optimal chance at cure, but also that kind of fits into their life pattern. So we spoke a little bit about prostate cancer patients who may use brachytherapy. Let's also talk about some of those GYN cancers. How can brachytherapy help those patients? Yeah, so there are really two primary populations within the GYN cancers that benefit from brachytherapy. The first is endometrial cancers. And so the primary treatment for endometrial cancer is still surgery. However, we then kind of do an assessment, you know, usually based on the pathology from that surgical specimen, 
to determine what's the risk this patient has of developing a distant recurrence or developing a local recurrence. You know, for those patients that have a high enough risk for a local recurrence, they're, they're typically offered radiation therapy to the pelvis in order to reduce that risk. Historically, that had always been external beam radiation therapy, but then there was a series of studies that were done that essentially showed that if you do brachytherapy in three to four treatments, that that where you're just treating basically the top of the vaginal cuff, that is equivalent to reducing that risk of a local recurrence as giving external radiation, which you know might consist of, of giving external radiation to the entire pelvis over the course of five weeks. So you kind of mentioned there how many treatments, but how long would someone with a GYN cancer yeah. typically undergo? So in that scenario where you're treating for end, you're treating postoperatively for endometrial cancer, those patients typically are treated in three to four treatments, usually over the course of about two weeks. The other cancer um, that it's that brachytherapy is commonly used, that's an, a GYN malignancy, is cervical cancer. So in cervical cancer, it's a little different. So in patients that have locally advanced cancers, typically they're not treated with surgery, they're treated with chemo and radiation therapy together. And so those patients would usually receive five weeks of external radiation where they're treating their tumor and they're treating the lymph nodes that are at risk. Um, and that's done usually with weekly chemo. And that's followed by typically three to four five sessions of brachytherapy where the radiation is just delivered to the tumor within the cervix itself. Um, there are a lot of benefits to doing that kind of a treatment regimen. Um, there have been a few studies that have come out that have looked at when you exclude doing brachytherapy and you try to just give chemo and radiation therapy, meaning external beam radiation therapy together. And what they've found is that those patients' survival is decreased by approximately 10% versus those patients that get a package treatment that includes external radiation plus brachytherapy itself. What side effects might those, can those patients have from brachytherapy, both for endometrial cancers as well as cervical cancer? Yeah, so that's a good point. They're two totally different populations. So those patients that are getting brachytherapy for endometrial cancer you know, we're typically just treating a very small area at the very top of the vaginal cuff, kind of where the uterus used to be attached to the vagina. Um, and, and so those patients have very minimal side effects. Usually less than 10% of patients might notice some loosening of their stool for a few days to a week, or maybe they notice some minor urinary irritations. But again, that probably represents about less than 10% of the, of the patient population probably 80 to 90% of the patient population that undergoes that treatment really has minimal to no side effects. It's very different than when you compare that to the patients that we're treating for cervical cancer. Those patients have just gone through five weeks of chemotherapy and external beam radiation therapy. And so they're already kind of coming to the table with some urinary symptoms, for sure probably some rectal symptoms, usually in the form of diarrhea, um, when we do the brachytherapy, because it's such a localized treatment, um, it's not contributing very much to those existing symptoms, but it may protract those symptoms by another week. There are a lot of misconceptions um, when you hear even just the word radiation. So what do you want people to know about this particular radiation therapy in brachytherapy? Yeah, I mean, I think anyone that's kind of grown up post-World War II, when they hear the term radiation, you know, it gives them pause for concern, understandably. But you have to keep in mind that when we're delivering radiation therapy in kind of this medical context, we're really looking at kind of treating small volumes that are very, with very kind of focused radiation treatments where we're really trying to limit the amount of tissue that's, that's getting radiotherapy. And so under modern techniques, it can be delivered in a much more safe manner um, so that you're less likely to see complications that people might think of from some of, you know, from some of the older techniques of radiation that, you know, for patients that might have received radiation in the 80s or the 90s, where they might have had like some bad skin reactions or they might have had, you know, bowel complications. Um, so the technology, just like all the technology around us, 
has really progressed significantly in the last you know 10 years um, and so a lot of the focus has been has been on minimizing the side effects and how we do that is by catering that radiation treatment to try and treat really primarily just the area where those tumors are and eliminate the radiation to the normal structures around it. Brachytherapy just happens to be kind of one of the tools in our tool belt that we can pull out that's, a, you know, is kind of an elegant treatment when done correctly because you're delivering the radiation from the inside out that allows you to give a high dose of radiation to the cancer with really not giving much of any radiation to the surrounding organs. So there are some types of radiation therapy that results in the patient not being able to be around loved ones or friends or family for some time after treatment. That's not the case with this high dose rate brachytherapy. Yeah, so you bring up an excellent point. So you can think back to the example that we used before, which is the treatment of prostate cancer. So kind of the, the historical way that was done is they would take these permanent seeds that were radioactive and implant them into the prostate. And those patients would be radioactive, you know, for three to nine months, depending on the isotope that they use. So there's precautions that they have to take around their loved one, especially around grandkids or children or small animals. In this case, when we're doing high dose rate brachytherapy, you know, the source or the radioactive element is usually only in the patient for a few minutes. And so, and then everything is removed. So those patients, you know, when they leave after treatment, at no time are they radioactive. How long is recovery time, though, after someone receives this brachytherapy? Yeah, I mean, again, it, it, depends, on the t it depends on the area that we're treating um, and the type of cancer that they have and the type of treatments that they may have had preceding the brachytherapy. So, for example, in the case of those patients that might just be getting HDR brachytherapy for prostate cancer, you know, the primary symptom we see is, ur is urinary symptoms. Most of that will go away within the first two weeks. Usually within four to six weeks, those patients are completely recovered. You know, in the case of cervical cancer, you know, those patients have gotten a bunch of external radiation. You know, their recovery time might look more like five to six weeks. And it's not necessarily because of the brachytherapy, but because of the compilation of treatments that they've had with the chemo, the external radiation and the internal radiation. So if someone has recently been diagnosed with one of the cancers we've discussed and they think that they might be interested in this high dose rate brachytherapy, who should they speak to if they're interested in this as a potential treatment? Yeah, I mean, I think a good place to start is talking to a radiation oncologist. Um, not all community-based radiation oncologists offer brachytherapy, or if they do offer it, it may not be, some of the treatments that they're able to offer may not be as sophisticated as many of the others. Because it is a resource-dependent treatment, you, we tend to see that it's focused at larger hospitals or at academic centers. Um, but starting with your local radiation oncologist and asking them about it, and if they don't offer that treatment, you know, requesting a referral is a good place to start. And that brings us to a good point. I mean, why is it so important to have a resource like the Brian D. Jellison Cancer Institute, which has these therapies available at a community hospital right in the community close to home? Yeah. So, you know, cancer therapy over the last 40 years has, you know, really evolved. And it's gone from going to see maybe one doctor who might have been a surgeon or might have been an oncologist to now it it's become really what we would call a team sport, you know, where the best outcomes come from those patients that benefit from discussion of their treatments ahead of time with the surgeon, with the medical oncologist, with radiation oncologists, with the pathologists, and with the radiologists, so that all the doctors can kind of come together and create a game plan. And then, you know, that game plan may require some more sophisticated treatments. So, you know, we're kind of fortunate here where we've got a lot of treatments, you know, under the sun that we can offer those patients that may not necessarily be available at all community centers just because either the sophistication that's required in delivering the treatment, either from physician training or equipment or just the resource dependence that it may require in terms of having a whole team, you know, that can involve nurses and involve technicians as well. 
Is there anything else you want the community to know about this high dose rate brachytherapy that we're now offering at Sarasota Memorial? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, the important thing is that it can be a very effective treatment, but in the appropriate patient population. And so patient selection is, is of utmost importance. And so finding, you know, if this is a type of treatment that you're interested in, it's really important not only that you find a, a physician you know that that is comfortable with the procedure but someone that has a fair that has the re appropriate training and does a fair amount of volume because it's think of it just like a surgeon you know you would you don't want to be you don't want to go and get an operation from a surgeon that's only done two or three of these operations a year you want to go to someone that's doing a hundred of these operations a year and so the same thing could be said for brachytherapy that you know you in order to get excellent outcomes you want to go to someone that does a lot of these procedures and is familiar you know and has a lot of familiarity not only with how the procedure is done but how it's done really well and how to manage those side effects if they do arise um, so that patients don't really have any complications associated with the treatment but it's important to note that other radiation therapy treatments still have a place in cancer care and not everyone is eligible for brachytherapy. Exactly. You know, so again, it's kind of like going back to the analogy of using it as a tool, right? So the way that we look in radiation oncology is, you know, we've got a bunch of different sophisticated treatments that we're able to offer, whether it's traditional external radiation, whether it's stereotactic radio surgery or some of the other stereotactic treatments, or whether it's brachytherapy, you know, and, and part of finding a good radiation oncologist is finding someone that's able to kind of pick the right treatment for the right patient, you know, at the right time. Dr. Biagioli, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing all this information. As always, we encourage everyone in the community to visit smh.com to get the latest information from Sarasota Memorial. Have a great day.